today we're starting a new series, all right? The way that we teach here at NUMA is through series, all right? And uh, we usually will take, you know, four weekends, three weekends, and, and teach a series. Today we're going to start off a series that it's, I, I'm sure that you guys are going to be blessed by it. You're going you're gonna to enjoy it because we're going to be diving in to learn more about the person of Jesus, all right, and actually the series is going to be leading us, all right, to Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday that are just around the corner, believe it or not, all right. They're going to lead us to April 17th. That's where we're going to close the series out. And the name for this series is Jesus Is. Jesus Is. We're going to be finding out different things about Jesus as we go along in this series, all right? And uh, and it's going to be powerful. God is going to reveal great things to you. By the way, I want to give a shout out to Pastor Max sitting right here. We uh, finished our Connect series last Sunday, and Pastor Max, you did a fantastic job. Can we put our hands together for Pastor Max? You see, having great men of God like him and Pastor Milton Todd in the second service, you know, allows and gives my wife and I a little bit of freedom to do what we're doing with, you know, Tampa and Orlando and stuff like that. And I know that you guys are not going to suffer in the word and what's being taught. And uh, you got a gift of teaching, man. You know, you could resurrect the dead with your teaching, bro, with your preaching. So uh, uh, I'm proud, man, to have you in this house and to walk with you. So I bless your life uh, for that. All right. Jesus is. Can you say that with me? Jesus is. Can you say it? Jesus is. I think one of the teachings is going to be Jesus is because he's everything. Jesus is, all right? And what we're going to try to answer in the series is, who is Jesus? This is a very important thing. What did he say? What did he do? Why the talks that he had over 2,000 years ago with his disciples, small group of men, why are those talks important for you and me here today? Let me tell you something. No one in the history of mankind has touched more hearts than Jesus has. Nobody in the history of mankind has changed more lives than Jesus has. Nobody has impacted more families and individuals than Jesus has. No one has been more polarizing than Jesus has. Because we live in a day and age where people are okay, maybe with you and I mentioning God. Oh, I want to thank God, you know, for today's victory and this and that. But the moment that you say, I want to thank Jesus, they're like, oh, this guy, this guy's a freak. You know, the moment you bring the name Jesus, it sort of like causes a t- tension and there's like a division. And, and, you know, there's a question. Jesus is just who is Jesus? This is a question that many people have tried to answer. And I think many have hit it on the head and many have fallen short. So there's a video that we have on screen this morning that I want you to to take a look at about who Jesus is. Let's look at this. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? That's the question. That's the question. Was he a real person? What did he say? What did he do? What made him so special? What made him different than any other man in history? The records show. His birth was a miracle. His mom was a virgin and she was pregnant. He made the blind see. The deaf hear. The mute speak. The paralyzed walk. He healed terrible diseases. He knew what was in men's minds. He knew what was in men's hearts. He knows what is in men's hearts. He knew the story of people's lives without ever having met them. He spoke with authority. He amazed teachers. He amazed everyone. Nature obeyed him. He turned water into wine. He walked on water. He walked on top of the water. He could change the weather. He fed 5,000 people from one lunchbox. He brought people who were dead 
back to life. He loved sinners. He loved everyone. 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 He forgave sins. He never made a mistake. He never once sinned. But we judged him. We whipped and beat him. We spit on him. And we killed him. He loved us anyway. He loves us anyway. He died for us. He died so that we wouldn't have to. He paid for our sins with his life. Did I mention he loves us? He came back to life. He was dead. Then he was alive. A lot of people saw him. He is coming back. Who is Jesus? That's a big question. That's the big question. What does it even matter? What does it matter to you? Who is Jesus? My answer doesn't matter to you. Only your answer matters to you. Who do you say that he is? Who do you say that he is? Wow. So even when Jesus was here on earth, when he was walking, when he was doing miracles, when he was teaching, that question that you see here behind me was a question that was posed. The people wanted to know, who is this guy? Who, who, who is this guy that, that even the winds and the waves obey him? Who, who is he? And, and, and something that I consider very, very important is that Jesus considered who men believed him to be of great importance. So there's a moment that Jesus is sitting with his disciples and, and he decides to say, you know what? I'm going to test these guys. I, I, I'm going to see uh, what, 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 what they think of who I am. And we go to Matthew chapter 16 in your Bible. And we're going to look at verse 13 through 15. And this is very interesting. Matthew 16, 13 through 15. And it says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? This is a, a, a nickname that he had for himself. Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? You see, he wanted to know what the people were saying around him, but then he took it to a more personal level. He wanted to know what they thought. Who do you say that I am? Am. So today's message, this is what I've called this message, because if we're going to start off a series talking about Jesus is, I think this is the point where we need to break it off. And the title of today's message is Liar, Lunatic, or Lord. Jesus is either one of those three. He's either a liar, he's crazy, and he's just a lunatic, a madman, or you know what? He is who he claimed to be. And, and that's what we're going to look at uh, uh, this morning. Because when you look at the person of Jesus, he doesn't leave you any other option. He, he, doesn't, he, he, he makes you choose, you know, uh, either his claims were false. <laughs> and he had a lot, you know, of important claims. Or his claims were true. And it's something that each of us in this room or watching through that camera today should give ample consideration to. The same question Jesus asked his disciples is the same question asked of us today. But who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? If Jesus' claim to be God is true, then he is Lord. And we must either accept or reject his lordship. And we're left without excuses. And we're going to look into that in, in a second. But first, let us consider his claims to be false. Let's consider that Jesus claimed to be Lord, to be God, to be God's son. Let, let's consider that to be false. And if it's false, we have two alternatives. 
The first one is either he knew it was false, or number two, he did not know it was false. So let's look at these two things separately. Number one, if you're taking notes, I'm going to encourage you to take notes. All right. Number one, and, and I even feel crazy to say this. All right. But number one, Jesus is a liar. Let's take that option. Let's take the option, all right, that Jesus is a liar. Now, if we look at this option this morning, all right, if Jesus was lying about being God, not only was he a liar, but he was also a hypocrite. Because he would teach men to be honest, to walk in integrity, to not lie. And if he himself knew that he was lying to people while he was doing this, then let me tell you something. Jesus might be the biggest hypocrite that has ever walked this earth. Because he was telling people something and he was going to turn around and do something completely different with his life. Not only a hypocrite, but you know what? Demonic as well. Why demonic? Because he's telling people to trust him for their eternal salvation, their eternal life. If he was doing this, let me tell you something, that's wicked. Let me tell you, that is completely evil if he was doing that. And not only, okay, hypocritical, not only diabolical, but you know what? Very foolish. Why foolish? Because listen, he ended up giving his life for what he was speaking. So if what he was speaking was a made-up lie, what kind of person is going to say, you know what, I'm going to die for a lie. And I'm just going to claim this all the way to the point that, you know what, they just kill me completely. But you know what? When I look at this consideration, and I look at someone that lived the way that Jesus lived, I look at someone that taught the way that Jesus taught, and that died the way that Jesus died, you know what? He couldn't have been a liar. He couldn't have been lying. You know why? Because let's say he was lying during his ministry. Let's say that he was making all these things up. The moment that they said, hey, you know what? You're about to die because of this. You know what? We're going to crucify you and we're going to kill you. You know what you say? It's like, all right, man. You know what? I was fooling around. You know, I just had nothing better to do. You know, I just wanted to, you know, to cheat some people and do this or that. Wouldn't you do that if your life is at risk? Of course. So he would have brought it out to the light. He would have said, you know what? This is the truth. So, you know what? I want to discard that Jesus was a liar. I want to, I want to say, you know what? I, I think he was being truthful with what he was saying. Now, the other alternative, number two, is that Jesus is a lunatic. All right? He's a madman. He's, he's crazy. He's somebody uh, demented. Because, you know, if Jesus was not a liar... Can it be possible that he actually thought himself to be God and be wrong about it? Don't you know people that have had good intentions, but they get it wrong? You know some people like that? Oh, he was meaning well. Yeah, he meant well, but he got it wrong. You know, it could have been that Jesus was like that. And remember that when Jesus is saying that he is God's son, that he's the Messiah, that he is Lord. He's saying it in a Jewish culture that is monotheistic. That means that they believe in only one God. So let me tell you something. He's going to get in a whole lot of trouble for saying what he's saying. If you've ever been to Israel, I've been to Israel about six, seven times. And when you look at the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, the way that they are adamant about their religion and them following God. And you know what? If you think they're strict now, they were a lot more strict back then. They had the Pharisees, they had the Sadducees, they had the teachers of the law, they had all these people there. And all of a sudden, Jesus rises up, you know, and, and he's saying, well, I'm God. And, 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 and you know what? They're like, who is this crazy man? Who is this crazy man? But if I think or consider the option of him being a madman, a, a lunatic, then I go and look at his life. 
And I say, where can I find traces in Jesus' life of self-delusion? Can, can I find traces in Jesus' life of him being a crazy person, a, a demented person? And you know what happens? I don't find them. I don't find, for example, in his teachings that promoted peace and service and love for one another, I don't find madness in that. I find somebody that, that, that's understanding something deeper than you and I sometimes understand. When, when I look of the way that he responded to his critics with such conviction and, 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 and serene, it doesn't seem like a madman. When, when, when I look at the way that Jesus had dominion, over, over the circumstances, and even over nature itself. Nature obeyed his commandments. You imagine that? You know, we were talking yesterday uh, with Larry about Hurricane Andrew. Anybody was here during Hurricane Andrew? All right. Some of you guys like, you were born during Hurricane Andrew? Yeah, man, I was like 15 years old during Hurricane Andrew. And in Miami, is before and after Hurricane Andrew. You know what I'm saying? It's BA and, you know, AA after Andrew. And I remember that when we were talking about Hurricane Andrew, we were talking that when the hurricane went by Homestead, you don't even know what speed it was going through because it ended up devastating and destroying all the things that could have measured the speed. Once it was going at 210 miles per hour, it just destroyed everything. You imagine that? So people really cannot calculate it was going at this speed. You imagine standing outside in the midst of a hurricane like that and saying, you know what? I'm tired of this thing. This thing is not letting me sleep. And I have a long day tomorrow, so I got to wake up early and say, you know what, Andrew? Calm down and stop blowing. And all of a sudden, Andrew just scratches his head, say, whoop, all right. You know, and just step back and like, Jesus just spoke. That's what happened. The disciples thought they were going to die because they were in the ocean and it's going crazy and all this stuff is happening. Do you think a madman, okay, is going to have obedience from the wind? How about from the fish? You know, how about from the fish? Because that, that story really just captures, you know, my attention. You know, Peter's fishing out all night, doesn't catch anything. Jesus comes around and says, you know what, Peter, let's go out and let's catch something. And Peter's like, we've been doing this all day. You know, we're professional fishermen. You're not. And Jesus says, let's just go out. And all of a sudden, I imagine Jesus just leaned over the corner of the boat and go, here, fishy, fishy, fishy. Here, fishy, fish." And all of a sudden, all the fish that were in the lake... <laughs> all the fishes that were in that lake of Galilee heard the voice of their creator and said, oh, he's calling. To the point that the Bible says that the boat started to tip over and they started to call other people to come and help them because that's how big the cash was. I don't think he was a lunatic. No fishes are going to listen to go, go Go over there today to keep his and stand on the corner and start calling some fishes. If you have any luck, you go ahead and you film it and you tag me, you know, on Instagram. PR Chris Garcia, that's my Instagram. Tag me. Hey, look, pastor, I have 10 fishes that just came over. And, and, and you know what? The Chinese restaurant doesn't count. The one with those fishes that are swimming in there that you just throw some, that doesn't count. All right? Like, oh, look, I have a bunch of fishes that came over. No, those are not counting, man. And what can you say about walking on water? You know, I've tried that before. I go like that, whoop, and just go straight down. Before, I could maybe hold my own, but now, just straight down, you know. How about feeding 5,000? Like the person in the, in the video said with his lunchbox, you know what I'm saying? You imagine that? Crazy, you know. And resurrecting Lazarus. I, I love the Lazarus resurrection. Because Jesus stands outside of Lazarus' tomb, and the Bible says that Jesus and Lazarus were friends. They spent time together. And even when Jesus goes, that his sisters 
Lazarus says, hey, you know what? The, 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 the one you've loved, the one you love, he, he passed away. He died. And Jesus stands outside of, of the grave, outside of the tomb. It's a, it's a cave covered with a rock. They take away the stone. He stands there and he goes, Lazarus. And you know why he said Lazarus? I've always wondered why he said Lazarus. Because if he didn't say Lazarus and he just says, come out, every dead person in the history of this earth would have come out from their tomb. He had to specify who it was that he was calling in that moment. Oh, no crazy person has the authority or the power to do that. No craziness manifested there. And then John the Apostle in John 21, four, uh, 24 he says this, he goes, this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. So John says, we've been following this guy around. We've been looking at the way he walks. We've been looking when he's sleeping. You know, we're, we're looking, you know, with one eye open, one eye closed when he's sleeping. And we're, we're tracking down what he's doing. And you know what? We're writing these things so that you know that his testimony is true. Then Luke, Luke chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, Luke writes, and Luke was not even a follower of Jesus when Jesus was here on earth. Okay, and look what Jesus says. I mean, Luke. He goes, many have undertaken to draw up an account of things that have been fulfilled among us. Just as they were handed down to us by those from the first, uh, the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So Luke is saying, you know what? I went and interviewed the eyewitnesses. I went and talked to those that walked with him. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated that's a very important word right there. I have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I too have decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus was a friend of his. And listen to what he says, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So Luke is saying, Oh, there's a certainty behind these things. I've certified them. They're, they're, I've proofread this. I've interviewed people. I've talked to them. This is not a crazy man. And then the one that I love the most is the Apostle Paul. Why? Because Paul was persecuting the church, guys. Paul was putting Christians to death. He hated Jesus, even though he hadn't walked with him. He just hated him. And Paul has an encounter with Jesus after Jesus resurrects. That changed his life forever. It actually changed the course of history. And in Acts chapter 26, verse 11, Paul is talking about this encounter that he has with Jesus. And he says, Many times I had to punish them talking about the followers of Jesus in the synagogue to get them to curse Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. One day I was on such a mission to Damascus, armed with the authority and commission of the leading priest. And about noon, your majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shone down on me and my companions. We all fell down, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get to your feet. For I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me. A crazy person is not going to resurrect. And here Saul is having an encounter with a guy that he hates. He wanted to kill his followers. And this guy appears to him in a vision. Tell the people that you have seen me. And tell them what I will show you in the future. And I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes 
so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. And so King Agrippa, this is Paul talking to the guy that he's talking to, so King Agrippa, I obeyed the vision from heaven. You don't go from persecuting Christians to becoming Christianity's number one spokesman, just like that overnight. (laughs) You know, you don't hate somebody and the next day you're on TV giving commercials of how great that person is. That doesn't happen. And that's what Paul was doing here. So this is not crazy stuff done by a crazy man, documented by a few peasant followers. I've had conversations with people. Oh, but Jesus' followers were peasants. They were not not that smart. Oh, Luke was a doctor. And that's why he decided to document everything orderly. The only gospel of all four gospels that is an orderly account day by day. It's Luke's. And then you have Paul, which was a Pharisee, a leading Pharisee. It's like talking about somebody from government. Because the Pharisees were the ones that led the nation of Israel. Politically, religiously. And all of a sudden, these are the people that are coming to Jesus. So when the disciples face The question in Caesarea Philippi, like I read at the beginning, who do you say that I am? We got to discard that he's a liar. We got to discard that he's a lunatic. So who do you say that I am? And then we go to Matthew 16, verse 16 and 17. And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. So if Jesus is not a liar, and Jesus is not a lunatic, then, number three, you could write this down, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Worship team, you guys could come up. And if Jesus is Lord, let me tell you something, and I want everybody in here to hear, you guys that are watching at home. If Jesus is Lord, then you have two alternatives. There's not three, there's not four, there's not ten. No, there's two alternatives. Number one, you could reject him and have nothing to do with his reign in your life. And you could assume the consequences for that decision. That could be one decision you make. Now, the second alternative is that you could accept him. And you can let him be Lord over your life. You cannot leave this room today or finish watching this video. And say, Jesus was just a good teacher. He was a miracle maker, pastor. He was a prophet. He was an excellent teacher. After hearing these facts that I'm giving you today, church, I want to tell you something, that none of those are valid options. He's either a liar, he's either a lunatic, or he is Lord. And today, all you guys in this room must make a choice. Today, all you guys here must make a choice. Who is Jesus for you? Who is Jesus for you? This is the most important question. And in John 20, verse 30 and 31, John closes his gospel book by saying, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. And today, if you're here 
and you decide to believe, you could also have eternal life and life in his name. I want to close by sharing one of my favorite stories in in the whole Bible. In the book of John, it records a man that was born blind from birth. And Jesus and his disciples are walking around this guy and the disciples start asking him, Jesus, why was this man born like this? Who, who, who sinned? Was it him? Was it his parents? Who, who, wh- why is he like this? And Jesus says, this guy was born like this so that the glory of God could be revealed in his life. So Jesus goes ahead and he does something that um, if you're ever going to do a miracle, please don't do this. He decides to spit on the ground. All right, he got a good one, you know, pulled back, you know, something like that and spit. And the Bible says that he made mud with that on the ground. The good thing is that the guy was blind, so he really didn't see what was going on, you know. (laughs) He might have said, hey, Jesus, is there any other way that we could do this? You know, he would have negotiated with the Lord. (laughs) Jesus spits on the ground. Would have been cool to get some DNA samples from that. But anyways, that's just something that came up to my mind. He gets it, makes mud, and puts it on the guy's eyes. And tells the guy, okay, go to the pool of Siloam and go ahead and wash. So this blind guy is taken by some of his friends that go over to that pool. And he washes his eyes. And all of a sudden, for the first time in his life, this guy starts to see And all of a sudden, when he starts to see all the people that knew who he was, they start coming to him and he's like, what's happening? What's going on? You're seeing. And he starts to describe. Imagine him trying to describe things that he's never seen before. And all of a sudden, the Pharisees, which were way out there, (laughs) they come and they say, "Uh, uh, who gave you sight? Guy has no clue. He couldn't see. (laughs) Who gave you sight? I don't know. But all I know, he says, is that I was blind and now I see. (laughs) And you know what? I am here standing in front of you today to say that this guy that walked here on this earth over 2,000 years ago, he touched my life and he touched the life of most of the people that are in this room. And you were blind and I was blind. But now I see Now I see. So listen, I want to conclude. So they start asking him all these questions. He says, I was blind. They get the guy's parents. And they go, but we're bringing your parents. And they bring the parents to court. And the parents were afraid of the uh, the Pharisees. So they're like, he's a grown man. Ask him. He, He should be able to say. They don't want to get in trouble. And then they come back and they ask the blind guy again, do you know who did it? And he goes, I don't know, but do you want to be his disciples? That's what he answers the people. And all of a sudden, when he leaves, Jesus shows up in front of him. And Jesus says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the blind guy says, who is he that I may believe in him? And Jesus says, it is I that I'm speaking to you right now. And the guy fell to his knees and he said, my Lord, I believe. Guy that I had never saw before stands in front of Jesus one time and just falls to his knees and declares his Lordship because his life had been changed forever. Today, that same Jesus is in this room. He's here and he wants to touch your life. And he is asking you the question, who do you say that I am? I want you to close your eyes right there where you're at. Oh, and he's just touching hearts this morning. He's touching my heart up here. And you see, he brought you into this room today. He allowed you to turn into that transmission today. Because he wants to go into your heart, into the areas in your life 
and bring about a change that you can never do it on your own. You can never do it in your own strength. But the same one that spoke and the waves obeyed is the same one that could speak to whatever storm is going on in your life and bring peace and tranquility and give you eternal life. So there with your eyes closed and head bowed, I just want you to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you telling me through this message that I'm hearing today? And just take a moment and just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And with your eyes closed and head bowed, I want to give an invitation this morning to those that have never invited Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Today, I want to give you that opportunity. We've discarded that he's a liar. We've discarded that he's a madman or a lunatic. And we've arrived at the conclusion that Jesus is exactly who he said that he was. He was God's son, the Messiah, the Lord. And today in this room, like John said there at the end of his gospel, if you receive him as your Lord and Savior, you receive the gift of eternal life. And all you got to do this morning is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. That's what the Bible says. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth unto salvation. So if anybody in this room today or watching through that camera want to make that decision, with your head bowed, I want you to repeat these words with me. And you're going to repeat and say, Lord Jesus, today I receive you in my heart as my Lord and my Savior. I want to thank you, Jesus, for coming to this earth, living a perfect life, to be my perfect sacrifice on the cross. I ask you, Jesus, for forgiveness for all my sins. And from this moment on, I declare myself to be forgiven. I declare myself to be a son or daughter of God and to have the gift of eternal life, which is a relationship with my heavenly Father and a relationship with you, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. Fill me with your presence and allow me to live for the purpose for which you created me. Say, thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen and amen.